Welcome to today's program, Legal Ethics Representing the Devil. My name is Zach McGee. I'm a Senior Vice President Business Affairs for Sony Pictures Entertainment. Prior to joining Sony Pictures, I was an in-house lawyer at NBC Universal, and before that, I was a lawyer at Davis Polk. I've been writing and speaking on legal education topics for the past 20 years, including having taught a course on legal ethics at Pepperdine Law School. As you might expect, I'm speaking today solely on behalf of myself, and my views don't reflect those of my current or any former employers or institutions with which I've been affiliated. The topic of today's program is something that doesn't get as much treatment as it should. What are your legal and ethical obligations when you discover that your client turns out to be the devil incarnate, or at the very least, a very bad and unethical individual? I think everyone knows that as lawyers, we owe the same ethical obligations to all of our clients, whether they are good people or bad ones. Duties to keep client confidences, to zealously represent our clients within the bounds of the law, and to fully inform our clients of important case developments are all present when we find ourselves representing bad folks. But what is different is when a client decides to conduct him or herself in a manner that violates the law, we have other ethical obligations that kick in. For example, the duty not to assist a client in committing a crime, not to present false evidence or testimony to a court, etc. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002 and also the SEC's Rule 205 now regulate directly the conduct of lawyers who represent public companies and thus impose additional obligations on lawyers who find themselves representing bad guys in that context. This is the area of the law and the legal ethics rules that we're going to explore today in some detail. Now, we're going to use a real life example as our hypothetical, and it's the case of Martin Shkreli. You probably know the name Martin Shkreli, but in case you don't or you don't, or you don't recall how you know his name, Mr. Shkreli first gained notoriety back in 2015. In that year, Mr. Shkreli controlled a company called Turing Pharmaceuticals that acquired the rights to Daraprim, a drug that is standard treatment for a life-threatening parasite infection. As CEO and controlling shareholder, Shkreli promptly caused Turing to raise the price of Daraprim from $13.50 to $750, which could cost some patients hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. Shkreli, who was a former hedge fund manager who made his fortune urging the FDA to reject, to reject drug applications of stocks he was short selling, also pursued a controlled distribution strategy for Daraprim that erected practical barriers to the creation of a generic substitute. In a civil fraud case, Mr. Shkreli was ordered to return $64.6 million in profits from the Daraprim price hike and has been barred for life from the pharmaceutical industry. That is probably how you know the name Martin Shkreli. And while the Turing Pharmaceuticals case is part of the background here, it's not going to be our focus. Rather, we're going to focus on Mr. Shkreli's conduct that ultimately caused him to spend four years in prison following his conviction on two fraud counts for deceiving investors in two other entities that he controlled. What's even more relevant is that the lawyer who was representing Mr. Shkreli and these entities, a man named Evan Griebel, was himself convicted of conspiracy to commit wire fraud and conspiracy to commit securities fraud, sentenced to 18 months in prison, and ordered to pay over $10 million in restitution for these offenses. Griebel also, of course, lost his law license as a result of his criminal convictions. Our program today will review in detail the facts and circumstances of the case that caused both Mr. Shkreli and Mr. Griebel to be convicted and focus on what Mr. Griebel should have done differently to fulfill his legal and ethical obligations as a lawyer. It's also important background to observe that at the time Mr. Griebel began representing Mr. Shkreli, Mr. Shkreli was not universally regarded to be a bad guy. He hadn't yet pulled the Daraprim price hike, and I'm sure Mr. Griebel had little reason to believe that Mr. Shkreli was anything other than a young CEO who was looking for legal help with various companies that he had founded. As a lawyer, you are always on the lookout for new clients, particularly young, smart people who start companies, because those clients who start out small can turn into much larger clients down the road if things go well. I'm sure that is how Mr. Griebel viewed Mr. Shkreli at the start of their relationship. That probably did and should have changed over the course of Mr. Griebel's representation of Mr. Shkreli, as we shall see as we go through the facts of the case. But my point is that I'm sure at the outset, this was similar to any new client relationship where you have no reason to believe that your client is a bad guy, much less the devil incarnate, at least as far as clients go. I make the point both to emphasize that what happened to Mr. Griebel could happen to any of us if we're not careful, 
and also to distinguish it from a case where you choose at the outset to represent a really bad guy. Everyone deserves legal representation, even monsters. We all know that. And so we should not look down upon those lawyers who choose to take on those representations. Think about the Harvey Weinsteins, Bill Cosbys, and the O.J. Simpsons of the world. Even those monsters deserve to be represented by competent counsel, and no one is disputing that. But when those lawyers took on those representations, they knew what they were signing up to. Yes, technically, none of these guys had been found guilty of what they were accused of doing before they were tried and convicted, or in the cases of Bill Cosby and O.J. Simpson, they avoided conviction even though most people believed them to be guilty of the offenses of which they were charged. But the lawyers who took on those cases at the outset knew what they were getting into. There were multiple allegations by multiple women over dozens of years in the cases of Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby, and overwhelming evidence of guilt in the case of O.J. Simpson that would have caused any reasonable person, including reasonable lawyers, to know that these were not choir boys they were signing up to represent. Again, these lawyers shouldn't be blamed for representing bad people. Our system relies on and requires lawyers to do that, but it's not a situation where they can say they were not going into that representation with their eyes wide open. The Screlly case is very different in that to Mr. Griebel, I'm sure the prospect of representing a young, smart, successful entrepreneur was an attractive one and one that most lawyers would leap at for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Mr. Screlly did not have a reputation for criminality, nor were there allegations lodged against him for fraud or anything else. Mr. Griebel did not sign up to represent a suspected fraudster, so it's a different case from the lawyers who represented Harvey Weinstein, for example. Now, the legal ethics rules don't change based on whether you know or suspect that your client is guilty of a past crime, but the lesson here is that even people who seem good or at least decent can turn out to be really bad. As a result, as a lawyer, you need to be prepared for the possibility that your wonderful new client can turn out to be a bad person who is intent on committing a crime so that you can take appropriate steps to protect yourself in that circumstance. Mr. Griebel failed to do that and his life and career were ruined as a result. Lest you think this could never happen to you, I ask you to take a moment to consider who Evan Griebel is, or at least who he was prior to his criminal conviction. I submit that in his career up to that point, Mr. Griebel was probably like you, a gentle viewer, a successful lawyer with a thriving practice. Mr. Griebel graduated from the University of Michigan and Georgetown Law School before becoming a partner, first at Catton Muchen and later at Case Scholler. At both firms, he specialized in mergers and acquisitions, corporate finance, and securities law across numerous industries. My point, of course, is that you this could happen to you, and I'll do my best over the next hour to give you some guidance on what to do if it does. We're going to use the facts of Mr. Shkreli's fraud as a hypothetical to spot the legal ethics and securities law issues it raises and to offer some advice on how a lawyer ethically could deal with them. Now, this is a very serious matter because of what happened to Mr. Griebel, as well as to the investors who were victimized by Mr. Shkreli, and I have no intention of minimizing any of that. That said, we're going to have a little bit of fun today as well, primarily by making fun of Mr. Shkreli, who's probably one of the most arrogant people on the planet, at least before he was convicted and sent to jail, who engaged in a lot of truly outrageous behavior. At the height of the Daraprim scandal, Mr. Shkreli earned the nickname, the most hated man in America. So we'll explain why that was the case with some examples of what he did. Besides being funny, it's also relevant to Mr. Griebel's situation as his lawyer. For example, after he increased the price of Daraprim 56 fold, Congress subpoenaed Mr. Shkreli to testify. At the hearing, Mr. Shkreli took the fifth on all questions. And then later that same day tweeted, quote, Hard to accept that these imbeciles represent the people in our government, end quote. Despite being a smart guy, it was obvious to everyone, except Mr. Shkreli, Mr. Shkreli was bor had born to lose tattooed on his forehead and was headed for a spectacular fall. While we can give Mr. Griebel the benefit of the doubt that at the start of his representation, Mr. Shkreli probably seemed like a great client and a great guy, but as time passed and more and more of Mr. Shkreli's antics played out, revealing his true character, it should have given Mr. Griebel pause. It should have caused Mr. Griebel to believe Mr. Shkreli less and to scrutinize his representations and his motivations more. Mr. Shkreli never revealed himself to be Bernie Madoff, but I think it's also hard for Mr. Griebel to claim that he had no idea Mr. Shkreli was a bad guy who was up to no good by the time the fraud of which both men were convicted was consummated. This brings us back to the key question we're going to attempt to answer today. If we find ourselves representing someone like Mr. Shkreli, what are a lawyer's ethical obligations? 
The answer is not as clear as you might think, and in order to provide you with some useful guidance, we'll need to review not only the ethics rules, including some amendments to those rules brought about by Congress's passage of Section 307 of the Sarbanes-Axley Act of 2002, but also the SEC's Rule 205 that now regulates directly the conduct of lawyers who represent public companies. Let's start with the key legal ethics rules that apply to lawyers when we are representing our clients. These rules no doubt will be familiar to you, and they work pretty well when our clients are normal human beings. But they work far less well when you find yourself representing someone like Mr. Screlly, who is a smart, arrogant, manipulative fraudster. So we'll need to consider what a lawyer should do in that situation. There are several key rules that lawyers must follow in the course of representing their clients. While a review of these rules can be a little dull, it's necessary background for the legal ethics issues we will discuss later. To make this part of the presentation a bit more interesting, after each rule we review together, I will reward you by sharing actual comments prospective jurors made about Mr. Shkreli during jury selection in his fraud trial. These comments have to be some of the funniest things ever said out loud in court, and I assure you they will not disappoint. Let's start with the rules that govern the relationship between the lawyer and the client. First, there's ABA Model Rule 1.2a, which provides that, quote, a lawyer shall abide by a client's decisions concerning the objectives of representation and, as required by Rule 1.4, shall consult with the client as to the means by which they are to be pursued, end quote. This rule is intended to ensure that the client, and not the lawyer, is in charge of the attorney-client relationship, and that it is the client, and not the lawyer, who makes the decisions about what actions the lawyer takes on the client's behalf. The concern here is that because lawyers are experts on the law, a lawyer might wield undue influence over the client when he or she decides how to proceed in matters where the client is represented by the lawyer. Clearly, this is a good rule and good policy when we're talking about vulnerable clients, think about defendants in criminal cases or parties in a divorce, who might be tempted to defer too much to their lawyer's opinion on what they should do when their lives, freedom, or children are at stake. In those cases, it is wise to remind lawyers that we work for the clients and not the other way around. An issue arises, however, when you have a client like Mr. Shkreli, who is a smart, wealthy, arrogant, and ultimately using a lawyer to help him file documents with the SEC that perpetrate a fraud on his investors. When you as a lawyer are attempting to influence the decisions of a client like Mr. Shkreli, for example, to steer him away from making false statements in a securities registration statement, it doesn't help that we have a rule specifically requiring us to abide by our client's decisions. Of course, the requirement to follow a, lawyer's, a client's decisions is an absolute, as we see in Rule 1.2d, which provides that, quote, a lawyer shall not counsel a client to engage or assist a client in conduct that the lawyer knows is criminal or fraudulent, but a lawyer may discuss the legal consequences of any proposed course of conduct with a client and may counsel or assist a client to make a good faith effort to determine the validity, scope, meaning, or application of the law, end quote. So, we're not required to assist a client who intends to commit fraud if we know it is fraud that he or she is committing. But as lawyers, we know that actual knowledge is a high standard. If you question the truthfulness of a statement that a client wants you to include in a registration statement, and the client gives you an explanation and assures you that the statement is in fact true, you do not have knowledge of its falsity. Whether you have an obligation to conduct your own investigation rather than simply take your client at his or her word is something we'll consider later. But without knowing any more information, you have no knowledge that the statement is false and thus no obligation under Rule 1.2d not to include it in the registration statement you are preparing for the client. So while Rule 1.2d is as good, as good as far as it goes, it doesn't go far enough when you represent a client like Mr. Shkreli, who is smart enough not to tell his lawyer that he intends to commit fraud and is dishonest enough to come up with some plausible lies to assure his lawyer that the statements at issue are not false. That's Rule 1.2. Thank you for sitting through that. Now here's your first reward. This is how jury selection in Mr. Shkreli's fraud trial started out. For your information, Benjamin Brofman, who famously represented celebrities including Michael Jackson and Sean Puff Daddy Combs, and mafia figures like Salvatore Sammy the Bull Gravano, represented Mr. Shkreli. Here's what happened, taken verbatim from the trial transcript. The court. The purpose of jury selection is to ensure fairness and impartiality in this case. If you think that you could not be fair and impartial, it is your duty to tell me. All right, juror number one. Juror number one, I'm aware of the defendant and I hate him. Mr. Benjamin Brofman, I'm sorry? Juror number one, I think he's a greedy little man. The court, 
Jurors are obligated to decide the case based only on the evidence. Do you agree? Juror number one, I don't know if I could. I wouldn't want me on this jury. The court. Juror number one is excused. It seems clear that Mr. Shrelly had peed in his own jury pool and that jury no juror number one had made up his mind that he was going to be the first one to get out of the pool. Why on God's green earth would a criminal defendant pee in his own jury pool? If you can believe this, it's because Mr. Shkreli thought it would help him get acquitted. Prior to his trial, Mr. Shkreli gave an interview to the Financial Times in which he admitted to having a plan to make his case more polarizing by creating a circus-like atmosphere and encouraging hostile publicity. He told the reporter that his goal was to create the same kind of chaos that surrounded the O.J. Simpson, Casey Anthony, and Sean Puff Daddy Combs trials to obtain an acquittal as the defendants did in those cases. Here is what Mr. Screlly actually said, quote, I have this fringe theory that I've sort of stress tested a little bit. The more polarizing and popular a case is, the more likely an acquittal, end quote. Then after citing the Simpson, Anthony, and Combs acquittals, Mr. Screlly said, quote, what's fascinating for all these cases? They were all widely seen to be guilty, end quote. Even O.J. Simpson was smart enough to not to admit that he did it until after he was acquitted. So again, there's a reason Mr. Screlly once held the title the most hated man in America. The next rule we will review is ABA Model Rule 1.6, which governs attorney-client confidentiality. Rule 1.6a provides that, quote, a lawyer shall not reveal information related to the representation of a client unless the client gives informed consent. The disclosure is impliedly authorized in order to carry out the representation, or the disclosure is permitted by paragraph B, end quote. Of course, attorney-client confidentiality is the cornerstone of the attorney-client relationship, and if you are a cynic, the primary source of our economic power as lawyers, because we are the only advisors who are universally allowed by law to keep our clients' secrets. And it's a key reason that clients feel free to tell us their secrets so that we can help them with their legal problems. This is a good thing when our clients are normal people, but rule 1.6 can get in the way when your client is a criminal who is looking to use your services to help him commit his next fraud. That is because, in general, Rule 1.6a prevents you from blowing the whistle on your client's fraud, even if it is a fraud the client intends to commit in the future or is committing now versus one he has committed in the past. The thinking was that lawyers keeping client secrets, which is critical to getting clients to trust lawyers with their secrets so that we can help them, is more important than lawyers preventing clients from committing crimes or fraud, sort of like it's better to let 10 guilty people go free than convict one innocent person. Of course, like most ethics rules, 1 .6, Rule 1.6a is not an absolute prohibition on disclosing client secrets, and it comes with certain exceptions. Indeed, a list of situations in which you may reveal a client confidence is set out in Rule 1.6b, but the bar is pretty high for disclosure of client secrets by a lawyer. Once again, this is a good thing. If a lawyer could disclose client confidences whenever the lawyer thought it was the right thing to do, the whole idea of attorney-client confidentiality would be rendered nugatory. The most famous exception to attorney-client confidentiality is Rule 1.6b1, which provides that, quote, a lawyer may reveal information relating to the representation of a client to the extent that the lawyer reasonably believes necessary to prevent reasonably certain death or substantial bodily harm, end quote. In other words, if your client tells you he is going to kill his wife when he gets home tonight with a gun he just bought, you may, note it says may, not must, disclose that to the police and or to your client's wife in order to prevent her death or substantial bodily harm. The fact that disclosure is permissive and not mandatory, even in case of death or substantially bodily harm, says something about the strong preference we lawyers have not to get involved in something unless we want to and are getting paid for our time. Of course, this exception would not apply to a client who plans to commit fraud instead of murder. So a lawyer representing Mr. Shkreli would be required to keep secret his plans to commit fraud and could not disclose them either to the authorities or the intended victims. Under intense pressure from Congress and the public in the wake of the Enron scandal, in which Enron's inside and outside lawyers, in addition to its auditors, failed to report rampant accounting fraud by Enron senior executives that cost thousands of Americans their jobs and their retirement savings when Enron collapsed. The ABA in 2003 made several amendments to the model rules, including adding new exceptions to Rule 1.6 to allow lawyers to blow the whistle on clients short of cases involving reasonably certain death or substantial bodily harm.
We'll discuss those changes in detail later, but for now it's important to recognize that for hundreds of years in America, lawyers had no ability under the ethics rules to reveal client confidences, even if such disclosure was necessary to prevent future crime or fraud by clients. Certainly not our finest hours or really decades as a profession. Okay, ready for some more actual comments by prospective jurors? Here we go. Juror number 52. When I walked in here today, I looked at him and in my head, that's a snake, not knowing who he was. I just walked in and looked right at him and that's a snake. Brofman, so much for the presumption of innocence. Here's another, juror number 144. I heard through the news of how the defendant changed the price of a pill by upselling it. I heard he bought an album from the Wu-Tang Clan for a million dollars, the court. The question is, have you heard anything that would affect your ability to decide this case with an open mind? Can you do that? Juror number 144. I don't think I can because he kind of looks like a dick. The next rule is ABA Model Rule 1.16, which governs how an attorney-client relationship is terminated. Rule 1.16a states that, quote, a lawyer shall not represent a client or, where representation has commenced, shall withdraw from the representation of a client if, one, the representation will result in violation of the rules of professional conduct or other law. Two, the lawyer's physical or mental condition materially impairs the lawyer's ability to represent the client. Or three, the lawyer is discharged. These are requirements for mandatory withdrawal. And while the rule says that a lawyer shall withdraw if the representation will result in violation of the rules of professional conduct or other law, once again, this standard requires that the lawyer know that undertaking or continuing the representation will cause him to violate the rules of ethics or him or her client to violate the law. Short of a situation where a client is asking a lawyer to draft a contract for a service that is expressly illegal, such as a contract to hire a prostitute outside of rural Nevada, the standard is rarely going to be met. Apart from mandatory withdrawals, Rule 1.16 says that a lawyer may withdraw from representing a client if, number one, withdrawal can be accomplished without material adverse effect on the interests of the client, two, the client persists in a course of action involving the lawyer's services that the lawyer reasonably believes is criminal or fraudulent, three, the client has used the lawyer's services to perpetrate a crime or fraud, four, the client insists upon taking action that the lawyer considers repugnant or with which the lawyer has a fundamental disagreement. Five, the client fails substantially to fulfill an obligation to the lawyer regarding the lawyer's services and has been given reasonable warning that the lawyer will withdraw unless the obligation is fulfilled. Six, the representation will result in an unreasonable financial burden on the lawyer or has been rendered unreasonably difficult by the client. Or seven, other good cause for, for withdrawal exists." End quote. Subsections 2, 3, and 4 seem helpful when thinking about a client like Mr. Screlly, who is intent on committing fraud and expects his lawyer to help him file a registration statement with the SEC that will enable him to complete that fraud. But there are a few problems with these bases for withdrawal as it relates to a client like Mr. Screlly. For example, subsection 3 requires that the lawyer know the client has committed a past crime or fraud, which isn't going to give a lawyer a basis to withdraw to prevent that first crime or fraud. Subsections 2 and 4 are better in that they only require the lawyer to have a reasonable belief that the course of action the client is asking the lawyer to take is criminal or fraudulent, or that it is one the lawyer finds repugnant or with which the lawyer disagrees. The problem, though, is that withdrawing doesn't necessarily prevent the client from accomplishing his fraud, since he can pick up the phone and hire another lawyer to take up the matter. Nothing in Rule 1.16 requires or authorizes the withdrawing lawyer to warn a subsequent lawyer about the client's intentions, and absent such authority, any such disclosure would violate Rule 1.6. In addition, withdrawal under subsections 2, 3, and 4 of Rule 1.16 is permissive and not mandatory, so a lawyer could not be disciplined for failing to withdraw from representing a client, even if that client, for example, had used the lawyer's services to perpetrate a crime or fraud under subsection 2. Clearly, Rule 1.16, standing alone, does not do enough to help lawyers prevent client fraud. Ready for another awesome juror comment? Here you go. The court, juror 28, do you need to be heard? Juror number 28, I don't like this person at all. I just can't understand why he would be so stupid as to take an antibiotic which HIV people need and jack it up 5,000%. I would honestly like, seriously like to go over there. The court, sir, thank you. Juror number 28, is he stupid or greedy? I can't understand, end quote. I think that sums up Mr. Shkreli in a nutshell. Is he stupid or greedy? I can't understand.
The last rules we should discuss are ABA model rules 4.1 and 8.4, which govern a lawyer's conduct toward third parties. Rule 4.1 states that, quote, in the course of representing a client, a lawyer shall not knowingly, A, make a false statement of material fact or law to a third person, or B, fail to disclose a material fact to a third person when disclosure is necessary to avoid assisting a criminal or fraudulent act by a client, unless disclosure is prohibited by Rule 1.6, end quote. By now, I think you can guess the problems with Rule 4.1 as it relates to preventing a client like Mr. Shkreli from committing fraud. A lawyer is only liable if he makes a knowingly false statement to a third party, and a lawyer's duty to speak up if needed to avoid assisting a criminal or fraudulent act by a client is limited by the requirements of Rule 1.6, which generally prohibit the disclosure of client confidences. As a result, standing alone, Rule 4.1 doesn't require or permit a lawyer to blow the whistle on a client who is intent on committing fraud. Rule 8.4 isn't any better because it is also so general. Quote, it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to A, violate or attempt to violate the rules of professional conduct, knowingly assist or induce another to do so, or do so through the acts of another. B, commit a criminal act that reflects adversely on the lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness as a lawyer in other respects. C, engage in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation, end quote. Sections A and B only really can be applied after the fact once an ethics rule or criminal violation have been established, in which case a lawyer can be disciplined under Rule 8.4 for having violated the ethics rules or committed a crime. Section C is slightly more helpful in that it covers conduct that can be evaluated at the time it is committed. For example, if a lawyer lies to a client, he or she has violated Rule 8.4 because that is an act of dishonesty and thus can be subject to discipline. But as long as a lawyer doesn't lie and doesn't have actual knowledge of a client's fraud, a lawyer does not violate Rule 8.4 merely by representing a client who engages in fraud. Rules 4.1 and 8.4 are good as far as they go, but unless a lawyer is an active participant in a client's fraud in terms of making knowingly false statements to third parties on the client's behalf or having actual knowledge of the fraud the client intends to commit, he or she is not going to be required by either of these rules to blow the whistle on the client. Okay, so we've reached the end of our overview of the relevant ethics rules and you've earned your final juror comment. Enjoy. Juror number 59, your honor, totally is he is guilty and in no way can I let him slide out of anything because the court, okay, is that your attitude toward anyone charged with a crime who has not been proven guilty? Juror number 59, it's my attitude toward his entire demeanor, what he has done to people. The court, all right, we are going to excuse you, sir. Juror number 59, and he disrespected the Wu-Tang Clan. I think there is a lesson in that for everyone. Do not disrespect the Wu-Tang Clan. So how did Mr. Shkreli go from a young man with a promising future to inmate number 87850 in Brooklyn Federal Jail? It's a pretty short story. Mr. Shkreli was only 34 years old at the time, and one that shows Mr. Shkreli engaged in the same dodgy behavior over and over and over again until it finally caught up with him. After some success betting against several drug companies that later failed, which earned him millions in trading profits, Mr. Shkreli decided to set up his own hedge funds. One was called Alea and the other MSMB Capital Management, so he could keep more of the money from the profitable trades he made betting against big against the market. It's unclear how much money Mr. Shkreli made when his bets paid off, but it is clear how much he lost when he bet wrong. Alea Capital Management lost millions when Mr. Shkreli made a single bad trade betting against the market. Lehman Brothers was on the other side of that trade, and when Mr. Shkreli refused to settle up, Lehman obtained a judgment against Mr. Shkreli and Alea for $2.3 million. But this was in October 2007, right before the 2008 financial crisis. And if you can believe this, Mr. Shkreli didn't have to pay a penny of that judgment because Lehman Brothers went under before it could collect. Yes, while the entire world was holding its breath, hoping that we were not going to experience a total global financial meltdown, Mr. Shkreli was jumping for joy because a bank that had been in business for more than 150 years and to which he owed $2.3 million suddenly was gone overnight. It's probably right to think that whenever Mr. Shkreli is happy about something, the rest of us should be very, very worried about that same thing. Maybe because he didn't have to pay the piper when his big bet against the market went wrong, Mr. Shkreli continued to bet big against drug companies he thought would fail, hoping to profit from those failures. In 2011, Mr. Shkreli sold short 32 million shares of a company called Orexogen Therapeutics at $2.50 a share the day after the FDA refused to approve its application for a drug called Contrave. Sounds like a good bet, right? Wrong. 
When the company's stock rebounded, Mr. Shkreli lost $7 million on this single trade and MSMB Capital Management was virtually wiped out. Here's another problem. By this time, MSMB Capital Management had several wealthy and powerful individuals as outside investors. So not only did Mr. Shkreli lose his own money, but also the money of those investors who were going to be very pissed off at him if they found out what had happened. So Mr. Shkreli hatched a plan to use the stock of a drug company he founded called Retrofin to pay back the investors in MSMB Capital Management. Paying these investors back with shares in Retrofin wouldn't necessarily have been a problem if Mr. Shkreli had fully disclosed everything to the investors and also to the public shareholders who invested in Retrofin when Mr. Shkreli took that company public. But let's just say that Mr. Shkreli did the opposite of full disclosure, which is securities fraud. According to the federal prosecutors in Brooklyn who indicted and convicted him of securities fraud, the first step in Mr. Shkreli's plan was to turn Retrofin into a public company so that he could attract additional investors for that company and issue those investors shares that would be publicly tradable. Mr. Shkreli engaged Mr. Griebel and his law firm to help Mr. Shkreli take Retrofin public, which was accomplished by Mr. Shkreli purchasing a shell company for peanuts and then executing a reverse merger of Retrofin into the shell company. After the merger, Retrofin would emerge as a publicly traded company on the NASDAQ with 2.5 million shares of stock that could be given to new investors in return for fresh cash. The next step was to get the Retrofin shares into the hands of people who Mr. Shkreli could control. His initial plan was to divide, to divide the shares among seven friends and co-workers who would buy the shares from Retrofin for a pittance. One co-worker was offered 400,000 shares for $400. And then Mr. Shkreli would buy the shares back once Retrofin went public. The problem with this plan was that the shares in Retrofin that Mr. Shkreli intended to control could only be issued to people who were not aligned with Retrofin, i.e. not officers or directors of Retrofin, and who could certify that they alone controlled the shares and not Mr. Shkreli. This is the first part of the story where Mr. Shkreli's version differs from Mr. Griebel's. To hear Mr. Shkreli tell it, he faithfully sought and followed Mr. Griebel's advice with respect to how Retrofin was to be taken public and how and to whom the Retrofin shares were to be distributed. Indeed, at his trial, Mr. Shkreli relied heavily on an advice of counsel defense, arguing that he lacked the requisite intent to defraud because he sought, obtained, and followed Mr. Griebel's advice. And in doing so, Mr. Shkreli believed his actions were lawful. According to Ben Brofman, Mr. Shkreli spoke and emailed with Mr. Griebel virtually every day, often dozens of times per day, on every topic facing Mr. Shkreli's business, citing tens of thousands of emails exchanged between Mr. Shkreli and Mr. Griebel. Mr. Brofman continued, Mr. Griebel provided legal advice and insight to Mr. Shkreli, which Mr. Shkreli followed faithfully. Because Mr. Shkreli relied closely on his experienced legal counsel and other attorneys at the firm, Mr. Shkreli has a valid reliance on counsel defense. Obviously, the jury who convicted him disagreed. Another person who disagreed, vehemently so, is Mr. Griebel. In filings made by his lawyer in a motion to have his case separated from Mr. Shkreli's, Mr. Griebel's lawyer said, we will present strong evidence that Mr. Shkreli repeatedly lied to, misled, and omitted material information from Mr. Griebel and other attorneys at Cat Muchen. Indeed, we will demonstrate that Mr. Griebel was an unknowing pawn in a fraud about which Mr. Griebel was unaware. We will also demonstrate that Mr. Shkreli is seeking to have Mr. Griebel found responsible for his own misconduct in the same way that, over the years, he has repeatedly shifted the blame for himself to anyone and everyone around him. While none of this is funny, particularly for poor Mr. Griebel, Ben Brofman shot back what is a pretty funny response. As for Mr. Griebel's efforts to try and distance himself from Mr. Shkreli's legal issues, the fact is that Mr. Griebel and his firm billed Mr. Shkreli about $10 million for legal advice during the very period in question. If not giving him counsel, he should return the money. Perhaps more troubling is Brofman's accusation that Mr. Griebel's argument about being misled by Mr. Shkreli is patently unfounded and flatly contradicted by the written communications between Mr. Shkreli and Mr. Griebel, as well as other evidence. Is it true that Mr. Shkreli shared all relevant information with Mr. Griebel? If so, how could Mr. Griebel contend he was not aware of Mr. Shkreli's fraud? As noted, we have no way of knowing who is telling the truth and who is lying as between Mr. Shkreli and Mr. Griebel, except we do know that Mr. Shkreli already has been convicted of fraud, was at one time the most hated man in America, and is otherwise not a very nice person. But Mr. Griebel also was convicted of conspiring with Mr. Shkreli to commit wire and securities fraud, thoroughly disgraced and disbarred. So it's unclear who we should believe, if anyone, given that two juries found both of these men to be liars and fraudsters. That said, let's take a look at what we do know about their communications over issuance of the shares in Retrofin. 
One important thing to note, when your client raises advice of counsel as a defense, the client waives the attorney-client privilege with respect to that advice, which means that all of your communications with your client become discoverable. So the jury was entitled to see emails between Mr. Screlly and Mr. Griebel that otherwise would have been privileged, although the prosecutors might have been able to get some of them admitted under the crime fraud exception. Remember that to comply with the securities laws, the recipients of the newly issued shares of Retrofin could not be officers or directors of Retrofin, and they had to certify that they alone controlled the shares and not Mr. Screlly. When Mr. Griebel emailed Mr. Screlly to ask about the stock recipients so that he could prepare the registration statement, Mr. Griebel wrote, quote, I'm listing everyone's address as care of MSMB. Does that work for you? Mr. Shrelly shot back, no. In addition, once Mr. Shkreli learned of the no officers or directors requirement from Mr. Griebel, he informed Mr. Griebel that Retrofin would have only four employees going forward, none of whom would be receiving any shares. At some prior point prior to filing the registration statement on Mr. Shkreli's behalf, Mr. Griebel asked each of the intended recipients of Retrofin stock to confirm that they were not officers or directors of Retrofin and that they alone controlled the shares, which each of them dutifully did. Following these confirmations, Mr. Griebel filed the registration statement and other documents required to make Retrofin a public company and to issue the shares to these recipients. While the exchanges between Mr. Screlly and his lawyers certainly smell fishy, particularly with 2020 hindsight, these communications, standing alone, don't prove that his lawyer had knowledge of Mr. Screlly's fraud. As we discussed, ABA Model Rule 1.2D prohibits a lawyer from counseling a client to engage or assisting a client in conduct that the lawyer knows is criminal or fraudulent, but that requires actual knowledge, which it seems unlikely the lawyer would have had based solely on these communications. Likewise, Model Rules 4.1 and 8.4 require a lawyer to have actual knowledge that the statements he or she is making to third parties are false or actual knowledge that he or she is committing a crime or engaged in conduct involving dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation in order to be held to have violated these rules. But if that is true, can any lawyer who finds himself representing someone like Mr. Shkreli simply turn a blind eye to a client's fraud and not violate the law or the ethics rules? Prior to the collapse of Enron in 2001, and based on the law and ethics rules we reviewed earlier that were in place at the time, I think the answer to that question was yes, but that following Enron, the answer is no. Enron was a large energy company that coll collapsed once it was revealed that its senior managers were engaged in massive accounting fraud. The most interesting part of the Enron story is that this massive fraud had been suspected for some time by Enron's outside auditors, as well as by its inside and outside lawyers, none of whom reported it to Enron's board of directors or to the authorities before the company failed. As a result, Enron came to be viewed by the public and by Congress as a colossal failure of the company's accounting and legal advisors to protect the company and its public shareholders from fraud perpetrated by Enron's senior management. In the wake of Enron, Congress passed the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, affectionately known as SOX, that imposed substantial new regulations on public companies that required, among many other things, enhanced disclosures and periodic reports made to the public, and that directors who serve on key board committees, such as the Audit and Finance Committees, have expertise in these areas and be truly independent of the company's management. As for the failure by Enron's lawyers to report or prevent its fraud, Congress enacted Section 307 of SOX, which, for the very first time, granted a federal agency, the SEC, the authority to regulate the professional obligations of lawyers, which authority previously had been left exclusively to the states. The SEC implemented Section 307 by creating the Attorney Conduct Rules of Part 205, set out in 17 CFR Section 205. These rules apply to all lawyers, whether in-house or outside counsel, who appear or practice before the SEC, basically any lawyer who represents a public company or a company that is in the process of becoming a public company. Here is how one commentator described the sea change that SOX brought about for corporate lawyers. Quote, Section 307 and Rule 205 represent a turning point in defining what is that corporate lawyers should do. Lawyers representing corporations, both as employees and as outside counsel, can no longer justify their role as the lawyers, loyal servants of powerful senior corporate managers. The Sarbanes-Oxley legislation clearly expresses the public recognition that the duties of all corporate lawyers includes using their critical intelligence to help ensure legal compliance and not to stand mute when senior corporate managers breach fiduciary duties or cause the corporation to violate the law. Now, after Sarbanes-Oxley, the law recognizes that corporate lawyers must be gatekeepers, 
This role also has a positive social meaning. As gatekeepers, they are watchdogs, helping their large institutional clients obey the law. Their duties are to serve the independent boards of directors." End quote. While the scope of Rule 205 is narrower than this description suggests, it is true that Sox was a wake-up call for all lawyers that slavishly following the directions of senior managers at our public company clients could result in conduct punishable by federal law or the legal ethics rules. Rule 205's key reporting requirement is as follows, quote, if an attorney appearing and practicing before the commission in the representation of an issuer becomes aware of evidence of a material violation by the issuer or by any officer, director, employee, or agent of the issuer, the attorney shall report such evidence to the issuer's chief legal officer or equivalent thereof, or to both the issuer's chief legal officer and its chief executive officer or equivalents thereof forthwith, end quote. So now the standard is knowledge of evidence of a material violation of law instead of knowledge of a crime or fraud. So that's certainly better. But is it clear what qualifies as evidence of a material violation of law? I think it would have been, except that the SEC actually chose to define it, at which point all hope of clarity went out the window. According to Rule 205, evidence of a, quote, evidence of a material violation means credible evidence based upon which it would be unreasonable under the circumstances for a prudent and competent attorney not to conclude that it is reasonably likely that a material violation has occurred, is ongoing, or is about to occur. What? Is that a double or triple negative? As one critic of Rule 205 pointed, pointed out, quote, any lawyer worth his or her salt will almost always be able to conclude that it is not unreasonable to conclude that the evidence before her demonstrates legal conduct, end quote. But as flawed as the language of Rule 205 is, and it certainly is flawed, or should I say that I cannot conclude that it is clearly not unflawed, the spirit of the rule was and is a huge step forward for lawyers. If you are representing a public company and you have credible evidence that a material violation of law has occurred, you have a legal duty to report it to the chief legal officer or to both the chief legal officer and the CEO. And the fact that the evidence must be credible implies a duty to investigate and to ask questions, Otherwise, how will you know if the evidence you are examining is credible or not, and if it's evidence of a violation or not, or if the violation is material or not? Thus, Rule 205 forces lawyers into the role of gatekeeper, an active questioner of client explanations and documents, whereas before we had no such obligation. This is the part where the commentator is exactly right. After SOX, all corporate lawyers have a legal duty to use their critical intelligence to help ensure legal compliance and not to stand mute when senior corporate managers breach fiduciary duties or cause the corporation to violate the law. The other great thing about Rule 205 is that it gives lawyers a club with which to encourage senior managers to follow the law, because if the manager refuses, the lawyer is obligated to report up the manager's refusal to the company's chief legal and executive officers. Often a manager will agree to modify his or her position on what disclosures are required when faced with the possibility that you will need to get to these company's general counsel or CEO involved. This is perhaps the best thing about Rule 205. It gives well-intentioned lawyers the ammunition they need to encourage clients to follow the law, even if it doesn't go as far as it should to punish ill-meaning lawyers who are happy to continue to turn a blind eye to what their clients are doing as long as the clients continue to pay their legal bills. The SEC's adoption of Rule 205 led the ABA to adopt changes to Model Rules 1.6 and 1.13 to conform them to Rule 205. Interestingly, the ABA twice rejected making changes to these rules, even after the Enron scandal, and even after Congress passed Section 307 of SOX. But after giving it further consideration, and perhaps being reminded by Congress that the Supremacy Clause is not negotiable, the ABA adopted significant changes to both rules. Model Rule 1.6 was amended to allow disclosure of client competences to prevent fraud by a client. This change is reflected in Rule 1.6b2 and 3, which now states that a lawyer may reveal information relating to the representation of a client to the extent the lawyer reasonably believes it necessary to, quote, to prevent the client from committing a crime or fraud that is reasonably certain to result in substantial injury to the financial interests or property of another, and in furtherance of which the client has used or is using the lawyer's services, or to prevent, mitigate, or rectify substantial injury to the financial interests or property of another that is reasonably certain to result or has resulted from the client's commission of a crime or fraud in furtherance of which the client has used the lawyer's services." End quote. Whereas before a lawyer could only reveal client competences to prevent death or substantial bodily injury, 
These changes to Rule 1.6 now allow a lawyer to reveal client competences to prevent a client from committing a crime or fraud that is reasonably certain to result in substantial injury to the financial interests or property of another as long as the client has used the lawyer's services in furtherance of the crime or fraud. A lawyer also may make such a disclosure to mitigate or rectify the injuries caused by client fraud, once again as long as the client used the lawyer's services to cause those injuries. The changes to Rule 1.6 were a huge step forward for lawyers who seek to prevent a client from engaging in crime or fraud. The ABA also amended Rule 1.13 to permit disclosure of client competences to a third party if the lawyer believes disclosure is reasonably necessary to prevent substantial injury to the corporation. This change is reflected in Rule 1.13c, which provides that, quote, Despite the lawyer's efforts in accordance with paragraph B, the highest authority that can act on behalf of the organization insists upon or fails to address in a timely and appropriate manner an action or a refusal to act that is clearly a violation of law, and the lawyer reasonably believes that the violation is reasonably certain to result in substantial injury to the organization, then the lawyer may reveal information relating to the representation whether or not Rule 1.6 permits such disclosure but only if and to the extent the lawyer reasonably believes necessary to prevent substantial injury to the organization." End quote. While this could have been stated more clearly, the gist is that a lawyer representing a company may disclose client competences if such disclosure is reasonably necessary to prevent substantial injury to the company, which dovetails nicely with the lawyer's duties under Rule 205 to act as a gatekeeper to protect the interests of the company and its shareholders. Now, if a lawyer has credible evidence of a planned violation of law by senior managers, and if he or she reports it up to the chief legal officer and the chief executive officer, and if both of them fail to act, the lawyer is authorized by Rule 1.13 to disclose client competences to any third party that the lawyer reasonably believes necessary to prevent substantial injury to the company. This disclosure could take many forms, including disclosure to a bank or a regulator or to a successor law firm if the first lawyer gets fired by the company because he or she raised these concerns. Armed with Rule 205 and Rule 1.13, lawyers now have a set of powerful tools at our disposal to prevent crime, fraud, and other material violations of law by our corporate clients. And with great power comes great responsibility. Lawyers can no longer turn a blind eye to credible evidence of misconduct by our clients or disclaim any duty to investigate dubious explanations or documents provided by clients without exposing themselves to potential civil liability under Rule 205 and potential violations of the ethics rules under ABA Model Rules 1.13, 4.1, and 8.4. To quote Martha Stewart, who famously spent five months in prison after she brushed up against the federal securities laws, these rules for lawyers are a good thing. Turning back to Mr. Screlly and Retrofin, in light of Rule 205 and the changes to Model Rules 1.6 and 1.13, did Mr. Griebel do enough to question and confront Mr. Screlly when he was asked to file a registration statement that might not have been completely truthful? We'll never know the answer to that question because we don't know everything about what Mr. Griebel said or did and what Mr. Screlly said or did in response. In some instances, we have evidence that suggests Mr. Griebel did question and confront Mr. Screlly, as the law and ethics rules would seem to have required a lawyer in his situation to do. For example, after Retrofin had gone public, Mr. Griebel warned Mr. Screlly about his plan to buy back Retrofin shares from one of the initial recipients at a deep discount. Here is the email exchange between Mr. Griebel and Mr. Screlly. Mr. Griebel, you are the director and CEO of a public company. You have a general you have a duty of loyalty. Getting stock at a discount could be problematic. Mr. Screlly, F that. Mr. Griebel, this is a very big deal. Mr. Screlly, we can talk about it, but as an executive, I am free to buy stock. And if I know a shareholder is selling it cheap, that should be fine for me. Mr. Griebel, let's discuss. This exchange certainly sounds like a lawyer trying to talk his client out of breaking the law. But there were other email exchanges that suggest Mr. Griebel did less confronting of Mr. Shkreli and more enabling of his plans to deceive Retrofin's outside auditors. For example, when Retrofin's auditor began to question the settlements Mr. Shkreli and Retrofin had made with the investors in MSMB Capital Management because Retrofin wasn't liable for the claims they resolved, Mr. Griebel allegedly advised Mr. Shkreli how to handle the problem. Mr. Griebel, the current thinking is let Retrofin pay, get a note from the fund, i.e. MSMB Capital Management, and if the fund can't fulfill the note, Retrofin will write it off as a bad debt. And that is exactly what happened, according to the jury that convicted Mr. Griebel of conspiracy to commit wire and securities fraud. MSMB Capital Management indemnified Retrofin for these obligations, but never paid off the debts, which required Retrofin and ultimately its public shareholders to bear that cost.
In another case, Mr. Griebel and Mr. Screlly allegedly devised and executed a plan to call these settlements with the MSMB investors consulting agreements and to pay the investors consulting fees under those agreements, again to mislead Retrofin's auditors. In an email exchange, Mr. Screlly asked Mr. Griebel why a $100,000 payment from Retrofin to one of his unhappy hedge fund investors had to be structured as a consulting fee. Here was the reply. Mr. Griebel, we can call it a settlement agreement, but given the auditor's recent behavior, they may require it to be disclosed in the financials. I was trying to prevent that issue. Ordinarily, it would be unfair to Mr. Griebel to draw any conclusions about his behavior based on just a few email exchanges taken out of context. And this is particularly true where, as here, Mr. Griebel had the misfortune of representing a client like Mr. Shkreli, who was a smart, arrogant fraudster. I don't think it is hard to believe that someone like Mr. Shkreli, who was dead set on committing fraud because he had no other way to repay the investors in MSMB Capital Management, would have used any means necessary to accomplish that fraud, including deceiving his lawyer at the time and claiming after he was caught that he told his lawyer everything and faithfully followed his lawyer's advice. But we also know that a separate jury convicted Mr. Griebel based on this evidence. So I think we're entitled to infer that Mr. Griebel knew exactly what he was doing when he was assisting Mr. Shkreli in perpetrating his fraud. Now, in case you had any doubt, Mr. Shkreli behaved like a nightmare client throughout the entire period Mr. Griebel was representing him. Here are some emails that Mr. Shkreli sent to and about Mr. Griebel to give you a flavor for what Mr. Griebel was dealing with. Mr. Shkreli, why can't you do your job? It is incredible. Here's another email Mr. Screlly sent to Mr. Griebel. Mr. Screlly, I can't handle this. You don't do it until I remind you. You embarrass me. Here's one Mr. Screlly sent to one of the MSMB investors with Mr. Griebel on copy. Mr. Screlly, my lawyers are lazy and stupid and paid too much. I send them important emails and they don't respond. To add insult to injury, Mr. Screlly had stopped paying Mr. Griebel's bills when he himself was out of cash, so you can add that happy fact to the mix. I don't suppose Mr. Griebel enjoyed being abused by Mr. Screlly, particularly when he wasn't getting paid for it. Stepping away from Mr. Screlly, Mr. Griebel and the Retrofin case for a moment, let's talk about what any lawyer should do when faced with a client that the lawyer thinks is lying. First, it's important to recognize that even if a client is lying to you, you still have an ethical obligation under Rules 4.1 and 8.4 not to lie to your client. Clients aren't required by any law or rule to tell their lawyers the truth, and none of a lawyer's ethical obligations is contingent on the client having told the lawyer the truth. As we observed earlier, if a client lies to you, that can cause you to have an ethical obligation to investigate things further in order to prevent a crime or fraud by your client. But lawyers still owe their clients all of the usual ethical obligations, the duty to keep client competences, the duty of loyalty, etc., even to clients who lie to them. Second, it's important to think about the reasons a client might choose to lie to his or her lawyer. As one commentator noted, there are many possibilities, not all of which are necessarily nefarious. First, the client may not trust the lawyer and might be worried that the lawyer will use or disclose harmful information. Second, the client may be lying to the lawyer to be consistent with lies told to others. Third, the client may be unable to face the actual facts, such as a client who cannot bring himself to admit that he stole money from his mother. Fourth, a client might be lying to cover up for another's misconduct. Fifth, a client might think that lying is a quicker way to resolve the matter versus telling the truth. For example, if the client knew his film studio didn't use the plaintiff's script to make his movie, he might lie and say he never even received a copy of the script, even if he did receive it but never read it, because lack of access is a complete defense to an idea theft claim. Finally, some people are just going to be prone to lie to everyone, their friends, family, etc., and lawyers are just part of the everyone. So when a client lies to you, don't immediately jump to the conclusion that you are dealing with someone as bad as Mr. Screlly. In most cases, you just have a client who doesn't yet trust you enough to tell you the whole truth or who is telling a lie to protect himself, his company, or others. So what should you do if a client lies to you? It depends on whether it's a small lie or a big one. For small lies, you should focus on educating the client about the benefits of being candid with you. How you do this in terms of style is up to you, but there are several key messages you should convey to your client. First, tell the client that being truthful helps you to assess and prepare the client's case. The truth has a funny way of coming to light eventually, in business, in discovery, and in court, and you need to be prepared for it so you can protect your client when it does. A lawyer who doesn't know all of the facts and who is faced with a lawyer who does does, is bringing a knife to a gunfight. Second, tell the client everything you do to protect his or her secrets and how you could lose your law license if you disclose client competences without legal authorization. Third, you should tell the client that he or she has legal rights in the event client confidences are disclosed without his or her consent, including the right to exclude that information from being used in court.
The objective of your counseling should be to assure your client that he or she can trust you with confidential information and that you will use that information solely to help your client and not disclose it unless the client authorizes such disclosure or you are required by law or the ethics rules to do so. For big lies, now we're getting into Mr. Screlly territory and it requires a very different approach. The first thing to consider is whether you can or should withdraw from the representation. As we noted earlier, Rule 1.16 allows a lawyer to withdraw from representing a client at any time if withdrawal can be accomplished without material adverse effect on the interests of the client. In litigation matters, withdrawal requires leave of the court, but such leave is freely granted if the withdrawal can be accomplished without causing the court undue delay or prejudicing the client's case. So if a client lies to you about something major, consider whether you should withdraw rather than represent a client who would lie to you about something that important. If you do withdraw, you are still required to maintain the confidentiality of your client's information post-withdrawal with one important exception. If you withdrew because you believe your client intended to use your services to commit a crime or fraud under Rule 1.16b2, you are permitted to pass that information along to the client's next lawyer or to others who may be affected by the intended crime or fraud under Rule 1.6b2 and 3. I am certain Mr. Griebel wishes every day and twice on Sunday that he had chosen to withdraw from his representation of Mr. Shkreli, and it almost certainly would have saved him from being convicted of a crime, losing his law license, and destroying his career. You should remember Mr. Griebel's case when you are considering whether withdrawing from a representation that you have come to regret is something you should do. That decision might just save your career. If withdrawal is not something you want to do or if you feel withdrawal is not available to you because doing so would have a material adverse effect on the client's interests, then you need to roll up your sleeves and get to the bottom of what is going on here. When we were talking about a smart, arrogant, and devious client like Mr. Shkreli, you need to face the possibility that your client is lying to you because he thinks he can control the situation best if he limits your knowledge. As one commentator observed, if a sophisticated client lies to you, and if your legal work enables that client to commit a crime or fraud, you will be left in one of five possible situations. One, you knew the client was lying and you let him do it. Two, you did not know the client was lying because you did not ask. Three, you did not know the client was lying because you thought you would ask the right questions, but you had in fact not asked them clearly and unequivocally enough. Four, you did not know the client was lying because he lied to you and you failed to do an independent investigation to assure yourself that his statements were true. And five, you did not know your client was lying because he lied to you and the truth was not discoverable using ordinary diligence. In only the last of these situations is the lawyer blameless. So that is where you always want to be in these cases. If you believe your client is lying to you, you need to undertake an independent investigation to see if you can confirm the lie and uncover the truth. If you can do that using ordinary diligence and still fail to detect your client's lie, you have done all that you can and will have dis discharged your legal and ethical obligations. Each of the other situations puts you at serious risk of legal liability and violations of the ethics rules. The first case, you knew the client was lying and you let him do it, makes you at worst a willing participant in the scheme or fraud, which is what the jury who convicted Mr. Griebel found to have been the case and at best, a willing bystander to the crime or fraud who would be in clear violation of Rule 205 and Model Rules 1.2, 1.16, 4.1, and 8.4. The second case, you did not know the client was lying because you did not ask, is a situation that may not have created legal or ethical liability for you in the very bad old days, but after Enron and Sox, this is exactly the type of willful blindness for which Rule 205 and the changes to the Model Rules are intended to punish these lawyers. The third and fourth cases, you did not know the client was lying either because you didn't ask the right questions clearly enough or because the client lied to you and you failed to do an independent investigation, are the gray areas where the outcome is going to turn on your particular facts. Maybe if you asked all the right questions and your client responded with very reasonable and convincing lies, a court or a state bar ethics committee might find that you satisfied your obligations under Rule 205 and Model Rules 1.2, 1.16, 4.1, and 8.4. But on the other hand, if that same client used your services to perpetrate a massive fraud like Enron or is a notorious jerk like Mr. Shkreli, a court or bar ethics committee might find that you didn't do enough to investigate or challenge your loathsome client in those situations. Because you never know in advance how things will turn out for you, your client, or his or her potential victims, be especially skeptical of any client who has the unique ability due to his or her wealth, power, or position in the world to put your money, freedom, and law license at risk. I mentioned that Mr. Griebel is now a convicted felon who spent over a year in prison and who also was disbarred.
As if all of that weren't bad enough, Mr. Griebel was ordered to pay over $10 million in restitution to Mr. Screlly's investors, who he helped to defraud. That part of his sentence is actually the subject of a case currently before the U.S. Supreme Court because federal prosecutors are attempting to collect on that judgment from Mr. Griebel's retirement savings. Mr. Griebel challenged their collection efforts, arguing that his retirement savings were exempt from seizure, but he lost that argument both in the trial court and in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Unless the U.S. Supreme Court reverses, Mr. Griebel will be forced to forfeit nearly all of his retirement savings to satisfy the judgment. So the consequences of his actions likely will include having no retirement savings and few prospects of earning a decent living between now and then in light of his criminal convictions. Mr. Griebel's case truly is a cautionary tale for every lawyer. We're nearing the end of today's presentation, but before we go, I'm sure you were wondering whatever happened to Mr. Screlly. Despite his best efforts to completely destroy his life, Mr. Screlly isn't finished just yet. He served four years in prison and was released in May 2022. He is once again a free man and still a very wealthy man. Turing Pharmaceuticals, the company that owns Daraprim, and Retrofin both ended up being huge successes. In fact, the wealthy and powerful MSMB investors Mr. Shkreli repaid with Retrofin stock got more than three times their original money back. While it's hard to estimate Mr. Shkreli's current net worth, and I don't think anybody would take Mr. Shkreli's word for that, estimates range between $50 and $70 million. Compare that to poor Mr. Griebel, who is currently before the U.S. Supreme Court, desperately trying to hold on to his last $10 million in re retirement savings. It hardly seems fair that the lawyer ends up much worse off than the client in a case like this, but perhaps that's why this is a particularly poignant cautionary tale for lawyers. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Thanks for watching.